Thank you very much, Minister, um, for that detailed overview of all of the challenges and the changes that have been taking place within the energy network and the energy system over the last five years, but more particularly, you know, how your journey's been over the last 18 months. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your opportunity to ask questions of the Minister, to clarify elements of the policy. Um, as per our normal rules of CEDAR events, if you would like to ask a question, could you please uh, raise your hand in the air? A microphone will come up to you. If you could stand up, explain which organisation you're representing, and a particular plea, please make sure you're asking a question rather than uh, making a statement, because uh, people want to hear the Minister's perspective on, on these things. And while you're thinking of that, um, perhaps if I may, I may just ask you one question to start with. You've indicated there's been significant progress made in the last uh, 12 months. Um, I was fortunate enough to be at the stakeholders meeting immediately prior to last week's uh, COAG energy meeting. And certainly I can uh, confirm that there was a very positive response from a number of different interest groups around the room, uh, request for, some, for more details. But when we bring it back to the level of industrial customers, we bring it back to private energy consumers, I guess they still have one fundamental question which they're not quite certain about. You promise that energy prices will come down, but when is that going to happen? Because people are now suffering from significant increases in those power prices that you mentioned. Well, the reality is there is no silver bullet to reducing power prices, and that's why you have to take um, action at all aspects of the supply chain. Uh, you have to deal with the networks, which make up nearly 50% of the power bill. Um, you have to deal with the wholesale component, which is where the national energy guarantee is coming in and gas supply is coming in, because that can be up to 30% of the power bill. Then you need to deal with the retailers, because the retailers are at you know, the... Um, are at the, uh, the cutting edge of dealing with the customers and because we've seen a lack of transparency in some of the, the retail markets, we've taken action with the retailers to try to get more people off the expensive standing offers and onto to market offers. Uh, and then you need to take action with some of the green schemes in order to get more visibility, more transparency, and in the case of what we're doing, have a policy with a guarantee that goes beyond um, the, the life of the writ. Now, we have already seen a fall in the spot price for gas. So we saw prices above $10 a gigajoule that came down to around $7 a gigajoule. Um, this is quite significant. We've already seen, for example, uh, thousands of households change their contracts or their retailers and save two to three hundred dollars or more as a result of, of doing that and we've facilitated a process to do that. We've now passed through the parliament, we've got bipartisan support for it, the abolition of the limited merits review uh, process which had cost consumers six and a half billion dollars over recent years. So when we see the next round of a uh, determinations on networks, then that will flow through to the consumers in the form of lower prices. The other thing which I didn't mention in, in my speech, which is gonna be really important too, is how do we deal with market concentration? Because we've seen um, in the Australian market, in recent years, the big three go from having about 15% of the market to having nearly 50% of the market. And I'm talking about in the national electricity market. Um, that level of concentration does create challenges. We saw recently in Queensland where they are predominantly government-owned generators, Stanwell and CS Energy. We saw a level of gaming of the system in where they were bidding into the market very late at high prices, which meant that Queenslanders were paying on average 30% more for their wholesale electricity prices than across the national electricity market. Now, we put a lot of fed pressure at the federal level. That then led to the state minister in Queensland giving a direction to the government-owned generators um, to bid in more fairly, and we saw a 25% drop in the wholesale price. So 
it's a complex area. There are so many different aspects of it, but we are taking action um, in all elements of the supply chain to try to put downward pressure on prices, which you know hopefully uh, will find its way to the consumers sooner than later. Thank you, Minister. So we have a question over there, please. Table 15. Good afternoon, Andrew Dillon from Energy Networks Australia. Minister, thanks for your presentation. Um, and obviously you've highlighted the various parts of the supply chain and what's happening in each of them. Um, I would observe, and I've said this to the Minister directly before, in the network sector, um, there has been downward pressure quite a bit in the last couple of years. In fact, network prices are going down across the country over the last two or three years. We're here in Victoria today. Uh, on January 1 this year, network prices went down in all five distribution areas. And we're now looking on 1 Jan next year where retail prices may go up around 15%. The underlying network prices, again, are going down in all five distribution areas. Uh, my question is in terms of some of the siloing, I guess, we see across this. Uh, Energy Networks Australia certainly supports the National Energy Guarantee and wanting more work on how it's going to work, particularly from our side, obviously, on the reliability angle. Um, we see one of the dangers, though, in, as we go forward into a low emissions future of looking things in silos just looking at what generation is doing and then separately trying to look at what networks are doing. And one of the critical things, particularly as we see more and more large-scale renewables, is to get that integration of where do renewables make sense, where does new network to service strong renewable energy zones make sense. And my question is, how can we make sure while we're doing the NNG we don't lose focus on that? Look, it's a good question and it's actually one of the areas of focus for the Finkel Review. And so what was behind setting up this energy security board was to get the, the operator, the regulator and the, the rule maker all around one table. And as you know, there were 50 recommendations uh, that came out of the, the Finkel review. We obviously didn't accept the clean energy target. Victoria didn't accept the one about developing unconventional gas reserves. Um, but by and large, there was broad agreement to those other recommendations. Now, the job of the ESB is to work through those recommendations, which also include focusing on what you just touched on, which was renewable zones, getting better interconnection, transmission. I mean, when you're building more renewables, um, you're gonna need the transmission from where it's being generated to get it to market. We made a significant announcement last week with the Tasmanian government into a new study about a second interconnector uh, between Tasmania and the mainland. It's cut the, the first interconnector is called BassLink. It's had some challenges. But if you can get a second interconnector with breadth, more width than breadth, you could turn Tasmania into the battery of the nation because Tasmania has the roaring 40s, so they can get a lot more wind. It has enormous hydro assets. It gets nearly 100% of its power, you know, over 95% of its power today from hydro. And it's also got this potential for pumped hydro. And for those of you who aren't aware, pumped hydro is simply having two reservoirs of water, one at the top of the hill, one at the bottom. And you send the water down the hill through a turbine when you need it. And when power is cheap, let's say at the middle of the night, you send it up the hill and then you just reuse it when, when you want to generate power. Um, these are the, this is the way we can um, get much greater connectivity between jurisdictions and we can get better coordination through the Energy Security Board. So I think it's a very valid point. Um, and can I just mention as well, you know, one of the challenges I have as a federal energy minister is I don't have all the levers at my disposal, you know, to get the best possible outcomes in energy policy. Um, there has to be this coordinated approach with the states um, because historically... If you look in our constitution, energy policy was not a federal responsibility. It became a residual power that was left to the states. So the states have historically owned the generation assets, the distribution assets, the retail assets, um, and, and the like. So we need to get good federal state coordination. We can do that through the Energy Security Board, and it certainly was a priority for the Finkel Review. Thank you, Minister. Your, your challenges with the state sounds like my role, trying to network different parts of businesses together. It's uh, never easy operating in a matrix structure. Um, we have a question from table six, please. 
Thank you. Tenant Reid from the Australian Industry Group. Thank you, Minister. I, I have a question about price as well, but it's looking at a little further. Uh, Australia did have a global competitive advantage in energy. We are looking at the moment at a number of important measures to staunch the bleeding uh, on that front. But do you think that it's a realistic ambition to build a new competitive advantage in energy? What might that look like? And which of the initiatives that you have underway do you think is most important to deliver that? Well, it's certainly all of the above. We have to have a competitive advantage in, in energy um, because if we don't, you'll see job destruction. Simple as that. Um, the greatest example of where competitive energy prices is leading to an economic boom is the United States because of that shale gas revolution which we don't have. I think one of the things we need to do, um, Tenant, is, is to increase our domestic gas supply because obviously gas export gas restrictions, which we haven't triggered but we put in place as a potential uh, to do so, um, is not the answer. The long-term answer is more gas supply and so therefore lifting the, mor the moratoriums and the bans is critical giving landowners more of an incentive to develop their land. And, you know, South Australia did this well with a 10% um, sort of royalty payment that they were going to provide to the landowners. I think that's important. I think the stability of our system, if we can get that in hand, that will lead to lower prices. And the way to do that is through more uh, storage. So I think the Snowy 2.0 project which in could be more than 2,000 megawatts, but we've announced an additional 2,000 megawatts is very significant. I mean, putting in perspective that Hazelwood's 1,600 megawatts, so an additional 2,000 megawatts from Snowy Hydro is, is going to be very, uh, very important. I think that's important. And I just think more generation. Um, we know from the modelling that we released that the committed generation, which is largely renewables, um, will lead to power prices falling by $280 over that period, 20 to 20 to 2030. That's new generation that's coming in. That's being largely driven by the RET, but that's new generation that's coming in. Now, if we can get more generation that's coming in and we'll get that through a national energy guarantee, I think that will be important too. So I think the answer to your question about competitiveness goes to the supply side. Um, which will be uh, more more gas, um, more um, more generation, whether that's thermal or intermittent renewable, and more storage, to prevent that level of volatility that has led to higher prices, particularly in South Australia. Thank you, Minister. Do we have any other questions on the floor? Okay, um, over on the far left. Sorry, I may have missed one. Minister, Minister Frydenberg, Luke Menzel, Energy Efficiency Council. Um, I, th I think you've addressed the opportunities we have to bring down unit cost on the supply side of the market. You made some commentary at our National Energy Efficiency Conference last week around the opportunities we had on the demand side of the market to better manage our energy use um, while we work through the opportunities to bring down those unit costs, which no expert that I know reckons that that's going to happen anytime soon. So what do the businesses in these, this room have in terms of levers to bring down their costs, manage their energy use in a smart way so we can get through this transition? Uh, look, it's a very important question about energy efficiency um, because that's on the demand side. Uh, we have as a government a goal of getting a 40% boost to energy productivity by 2030. Um, and we're doing that through the built environment, through new standards for appliances, through support for businesses. I'll give you a few examples. A state-of-the-art air conditioner that's sold in Australia in 2003 wouldn't be allowed to be sold in the Australian market today. It just wouldn't meet the efficiency standards. A building that was built in Australia before 2007 uses 30% more power than the same building built after 2010. Um, what we need to do is get more uh, transparency in the system and we need to get business adopting more 
efficiency measures when it comes to energy. We recently announced, for example, new um, commercial building disclosure uh, requirements, which meant that if you're a certain size building, you had to put up publicly um, the level of energy efficiency. And we've worked out that as a result, and as a result of that, that will encourage uh, um, the, uh, the building operators to get a more efficient system which will save consumers $50 million. There are lots of different things that we can do in this space, but we are obviously thinking through how do we incentivise business particularly to drive down its energy costs by investing in more state-of-the-art equipment and more energy efficiency programs. It's sort of work in progress, but Luke's absolutely right. It's critical to getting lower power bills. By the way, getting less demand on the system, so to prevent that gold plating that is so expensive, but also to, um, to decrease our carbon footprint as well. Thank you, Minister. Over on my right, please. There's a lady there. Good afternoon, Minister. Is that on? Yes, it is. Uh, hello, my name is Helen Melissa, and I'm here as a representative on a number of things, the New Energy Jobs Fund for the Victorian Government, uh, the Vinyl Council of Australia, and also President of the ATA, the Alternative Technology Association. My question goes to the heart of how you see our transition forward, which includes innovation. Mm. So you've spoken quite a great deal about the constraints that we've had in the past, and certainly that is, I think we all are here because we totally appreciate that. And the new energy guarantee provides some opportunity. But I'd like you to elaborate, please, more about how you see that will enable innovation in Australia, which is, in a sense, perhaps the testing ground for what can be rolled out internationally as well around not just storage but energy efficiency measures, to some extent, we'd be well behind those of the rest of the world on energy efficiency, not just with regard to residential, but industrial, manufacturing, and what job opportunities we have here to be able to apply that, not just within Australia, but overseas, not just renewables, but also base load power, such as biofuels and those sorts of things. So can you elaborate how you see the NEG is going to actually impact or drive that change? Thank you. Sure. Well, in terms of innovation um, and technology breakthroughs, this is going to be absolutely essential to our ability to meet our Paris targets and to lower power bills and to create a more stable system. Um, it's probably a little appreciated, but under our government, we've seen both the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and ARENA um, put billions of dollars out the door. In the case of the CEFC, more than $4 billion has gone out the door. And in terms of ARENA, which is a grant program, more than a billion dollars has gone out the door, focusing on the latest technology and innovation. One of the areas where this has had a real impact is in large-scale solar. So, for example, in 2014, when ARENA did a large-scale solar round, they were paying $1.60 per watt of power that was generated. Two years later, in 2016, that dropped to $0.19 cents per watt. The investments that we're putting in batteries uh, is, you know, capitalising on this technology innovation and, and harnessing it. Um, so there is a really good story to tell about demand-side response, which is going to be important. Um, virtual power plants, smart grids um, and, the, uh, and the pumped hydro facilities that we're investing in, whether it's in Coltana in South Australia or where Kidston in Queensland or the Snowy um, 2.0 project. In terms of the National Energy Guarantee, one of the benefits of it is it takes a completely technology neutral approach to trying to reduce your emissions from the electricity sector, bearing in mind that the electricity sector is a third of the economy's emissions. And so if there is an innovative uh, way to reduce emissions, whether it's in a thermal power plant being upgraded, so it could be a, so a gas or a, a coal-fired power station being upgraded, 
or whether it's through the adoption of, um, as you refer to, biomass, which is again underdone in Australia but has the capacity of a baseload power source, um, or whether it's through uh, new storage lithium-ion batteries, whatever the case may be, with, um, with wind and solar, um, that will be encouraged. The demand side response is going to be absolutely critical and that very much is focused on new technology, using smart meters, what is called the Internet of Things to link everyone's, you know, uh, home computer, pool pump, uh, fridge, air conditioner to their mobile phone so that when the prices are really high, maybe the usage gets turned down. And to do that in a really automated way, that you don't have to make that initial decision, but the decision is, is made for you. Um, this is an exciting part of the future and I think under a national energy guarantee you will see all that new technology and innovation encouraged, most of all because you'll get a stability of that environment where people can make these investments for the long term to get the outcomes that we need as a, uh, as a community. Thank you, Minister. I think there was a question from Table 17. And this will be uh, the last question from the floor, ladies and gentlemen. Siham Knowles from Osnet Services. Um, one of the Finkel recommendations in 5.1 was to develop an integrated grid plan uh, across the NEM at the transmission level that developed almost a, a national plan in terms of the investment required based on what was happening uh, in terms of whether renewable zones yep. are being developed. How do you see that playing out in terms of the integrated grid plan will be developed, but obviously we see a lot of activity at a state level. How do you see that play or that um, conflict of, you know, state versus national in terms of ensuring that we have optimised investment to deal with what's happening at a national level across yeah. the NEM? Well, I think, you know, this goes back to this theme of a national approach. Um, we can't have the balkanisation of our system. We can't have... And I've been personally critical of some of the state-based renewable energy targets because by having a state focusing on underwriting particular investments in their jurisdiction, it means you might not get the most efficient economic outcome. And, and the Grattan Institute and others have been, you know, quite openly critical of some of these plans. So you, you need a national approach. Um, AEMO is going to be very involved in this idea of working out this transmission, uh, this transmission grid that we need on a national scale um, and I think that's going to be important but again the Energy Security Board building on the recommendations of Finkel reporting to the COAG Energy Council will drive that national grid approach which I think will complement the work that's being done on the energy security um, or the en national energy guarantee and will capitalise on the fact that we're seeing more renewables in the system and that as a result will require new transmission investments and we'll coordinate that through the Energy Council which has all the states and the Territory and the Federal Government sitting around the same table. Thank you, Minister. I'm going to invite Melinda up to the stage. Oh, what's that? Well, um, that's Melinda will come up to the stage. I, I just have one last question, if you don't mind, Minister. Um, last week in Hobart, um, the chair of the Energy Security Board described a whole um, sort of emissions reduction policy as a, as a nightmare. <laughs> it's been a nightmare for too long for too many people. Yeah. You have, over the last uh, hour or so, explained to us very clearly the steps that the government's taking, both on the demand side, mm -hmm. also on the supply side, the encouragement of innovation. So I think many of us can now go away from this particular forum feeling much more confident that the so-called intractable energy problem has been solved in inverted commas. Now, given you've done that, <laughs> I, I guess the question that's on my mind is that if you have that particular knack for solving intractable problems, have you ever considered perhaps uh, moving back to Europe and uh, <laughs> potentially taking on the role of the UK Prime Minister trying to negotiate <laughs> uh, Brexit? Because that seems to be another intractable problem. Oh, there are plenty of them. Um, <laughs> But look, it was interesting being in the UK last a couple of weeks ago. They have very similar challenges. I mean, they're even talking about having price controls, price caps. 
Now, for those of you who invest in the energy system, I can see why you wouldn't want to have price caps, right? Because how can you make investments if you're being told you can only do that, make it up to a certain amount? We need to get the market to work better. Um, but don't think for a minute that the political debates, the logistical challenges that we've faced here in Australia are being felt by Australia alone. They're not. I mean, Angela Merkel said to 190-odd countries at this climate change conference how difficult it was for her country to move away from coal. You know, this is coming after having very ambitious, you know, Paris targets. She talked about the need, you know, declining cost curve for renewables, which is so true, and moving away from the need for subsidies. So we're actually seeing across the world, um, you know, a very, I think, robust debate about all these challenges that we are facing um, together. We need to share those, those learnings. Um, we need to persist through it. But for the sake of our households and our businesses, we do need to get prices down and we need, do need to get a more um, reliable system. And I do think that in terms of getting the state and the federal governments to work closely together, the people in this room have a big role to play because the broad groundswell of support for the National Energy Guarantee, and at least for more work to be done on it, has very much helped get some states to put aside their political differences and to endorse that process through the Independent Energy Security Board. So everyone in this room does matter. I think we can be pleased with the progress we've made over the last five to six months, but there is still a long way to go. Thank you, Minister.